Hello, this is the preparation video. In this, we're going to talk about the kind of things you want to do when you're preparing to intubate someone. And this is all part of the MICU Fellows uh, course that we're preparing here. So when it comes time to intubating someone, the first thing you want to do is obviously do a history and physical, understand why you're doing the, the, the intubation and stuff. But let's get right into the nitty gritty. What kind of stuff do you want to have ready when you're about to intubate someone? And we'll go to Dr. Corrado for that. Okay, so we're going to intubate a patient. Again, since this is preparation, uh, we want to make sure we have everything ready to go, everything that we'll need to secure this person's airway. We're going to want something to give mask ventilation. In this case, we have an ambu bag, something that we're able to oxygenate and ventilate the patient with. We're going to want some type of naranga, so we want to have an array of blades, different people's faces, different people's shapes, mainly different types of blades, the straight, the curve, things like that. We may need it, the bougie. Bougies uh, used to introduce a tube, sometimes without uh, direct visualization, or in a way uh, that requires uh, something that we may not be able to reach with the tube itself. Suction is one of the things that we're likely to forget, but so, so important, necessary for visualization, uh, should the airway become filled with fluids, helps us to get control over that. So once we have all the equipment, we want to make sure that the patient is, of course, adequately monitored. Now, you might have to go flying into a room, but most of the time, if you're in an ICU, the person is already monitored, and you're going to at least have a pulse oximeter and an EKG. Uh, of course, in an invasive setting, you might have an art line, too, so you can send off blood gases, but you want to make sure that the patient is adequately monitored, too. So we have all of our equipment. We even have specialized equipment. We have monitors. Now let's talk a little bit about the drugs we're going to use. So obviously if a patient's moribund, if you come in the case of a code, you don't have to give them anything. I mean, you just put the, this is it. The laryngoscope is the extent of the medications you're going to give. But let's say this is an elective procedure. Then we have to start debating the pros and cons of the various drugs we're going to use. When it comes to this, you could sedate them with uh, midazolam, you could sedate them with fentanyl. You can basically induce, induce anesthesia or induce unconsciousness with automidate or induce unconsciousness with propofol. Let's first talk about propofol and some of the pros and cons with that. Uh, one of the, the big disadvantages we might have, particularly in an ICU setting with a fragile patient, is the compromise on hemodynamics that you may see with propofol. Uh, keeping in mind that propofol can be used safely, assuming it's used in proper uh, doses, used judiciously, uh, and used with appropriate monitoring. But again, this is something where you'd want to be cautious in the use. Aggressive use could put you into a very potentially uh, difficult situation from a hemodynamic standpoint. Now, for wanting to induce, and we're worried about hemodynamic stability, automidate is a is a, a, a very uh, handsome choice for that, and that would be. And again, the benefits of automidate are uh, it's less compromising to the patient's hemodynamics, so it can be used. Uh, with less of a concern for hemodynamic compromise. Now, one of the things uh, after you've given, say, an induction uh, dose of something is choice of relaxant. Now, we in anesthesia use, use muscle relaxants a lot. In the ICU, um, muscle relaxants are also used, but there's always some cautions. So succinylcholine has some pros and cons. So now we've had a patient who's been laying in the bed for a number of days. Succinylcholine a good idea, Dr. Corrado? In this case, I think succinylcholine would be a fairly bad idea. A patient who has been bed bound for a number of days, which is common in the ICU setting, uh, would be at risk for hyperkalemic cardiac arrest with the use of succinylcholine. Someone who's not up and around uh, when succinylcholine is used, you can get this large release of potassium, which would, again, severely compromise uh, their, their cardiovascular status. So usually we might go with something else, and that other thing could be, say, vecuronium or rocuronium. That has the advantage that you're not going to get the big hyperkalemic arrest, but every time you're managing an airway and you're giving someone a paralytic... The disadvantage of these is that they are not easily reversible. Once you've given them, uh, you're now committed to having to secure the airway in a timely, timely fashion. Uh, something like succinylcholine, which may go away quickly, uh, that benefit isn't uh, found in rocuronium, vecuronium, any of the other drugs that we would use for relaxation. So, as mentioned uh, in the earlier airway assessment uh, video, the thing you want to make sure is you, you want to make darn sure 
what's going on with this airway. If this is a really difficult airway, you might want to do an awake intubation or you might want to have a fiber optic or something. But let's say that the exam looks pretty good and you're going to go with this. That's when you would have these equipments and this monitoring and the drugs that we mentioned already. The final thing we're going to talk about in preparation is actually teamwork. You want to make sure you have the appropriate team there. All right. So now let's talk about, well, do you need to call for the anesthesiologist? Well, uh, in some cases you may. The, the whole crux of preparation is having the right tool for the right job. Teamwork is very, very important, but choosing the right team member for the right situation is equally as important. So for example, you have your maybe a fellow with not a lot of experience and the airway looks a little bit difficult that's when you're going to want to make sure you have anesthesia around. You're a fellow with a lot of experience, then maybe you don't need to have them around. You want to make sure you have other people around too. You want to make sure you have respiratory therapy around because they're going to want to hook up to the ventilator. Uh, and you want to make sure you have adequate nursing around. One of the things that we encounter all the time is we come in and it's like, do we have an IV? Do we have an IV that we have access to? And that's where the teamwork is really important. You need to be able to work with the ICU staff and make sure that, for example, you don't give your injection drugs through an IV that's all full of dopamine. And suddenly you just gave the guy a bolus of dopamine and the pressure goes through the roof and the heart rate goes all crazy. So the teamwork of having respiratory therapy there, having the nurses there, having the appropriate specialties there if needed is just as important as having all of the equipment. You also want to have drilled together a few times. You want to make sure, hey, you know, what are we going to do if I can't intubate? Uh, what's our recourse for calling for help? Can we get the equipment up here? Another important thing about teamwork is thinking about the time of day. If you're taking on a really, really difficult airway, really three in the morning is not the time to do it. Of course, you do it if it's an emergency. But you want to think to yourself, hey, should we be doing this at a time of day when we have plenty of help around? So that uh, basically uh, summarizes our uh, video on preparation. Let's do a quick review. You want to make sure you have the appropriate equipment. You want to make sure you have the appropriate medications, a good plan for your medications. And you want to make sure you have the appropriate teamwork.